I am Nathaniel Hendry, and I'm from Knoxville, Tennessee, and I'm a chalk artist, so I'll be drawing this picture as I tell the story. The point is to help you remember the story better. And today I'm going to be talking about the story of Jim Elliott and Nate Saint and the others who were involved in Operation Aka back in 1956. You know, it's kind of interesting when you think of the dedication that some people had and the commitment that they had to sharing the gospel with others. They didn't stop when it stopped being comfortable or when they got mad at someone or because of some other silly reason. They knew that they had a mission to do. They had a reason for being there. So that's what they did. They didn't let small petty things get in the way. Or even big things, like the fact that the Akas were known as the Naked Savages. That was what the name Aka meant. They knew that they needed the gospel, and so they were prepared to give everything in order to have them hear it. When Jim Elliott and Nate Saint, Pete Fleming, Ed McCulley, and Roger Udarian were working in Ecuador, they heard about the Akas and one by one decided that they were going to reach them. They knew about the background of the Akas and so they would try to come up with ways that they would be able to be accepted and have a friendly greeting. For example, you may be familiar with the mechanism that Nate Saint, the pilot, used to fly around in a circle and slowly drop down the gifts to the village. And eventually, the villagers actually returned several presents. Of course, they weren't the ones that we would think would be that valuable. They were, you know, parts of birds and rabbits and headdresses and that type of thing. But it seemed like they were making progress with the villagers. So they were encouraged and they decided that they were going to actually go into the tribe and try to witness to them. And so they found a beach, a long sandbar along the edge of the Curray River where they decided they could land was close to the village. So Nate Saint, one by one, took the others onto that beach where they started making calls in the Aka language, or Wayodani, that's what the people called themselves, the Wayodani. They would make calls saying, we're your friends and we're here and we love you. And they did this for several days without any success. And then finally, a few of the Wayodani came out of the jungle and they uh, interacted with the missionaries. In fact, the missionaries named the boy George and then they named the woman Delilah. George was actually really interested in the airplane, and so Nate Saint took him up and let him fly around a little bit. And overall, the whole meeting was very encouraging to all of the missionaries. You see, they had a purpose in what they were doing. They had one goal to reach these people with the gospel. And it was something that had been brewing in their hearts for a long time, ever since they were students back at Wheaton College and the other colleges that they'd gone to. All of them had been dedicated to that purpose. Even if it led them to jungle, even if it led them to death, they were not afraid. The night before they went out, they had sung a hymn 
we rest on thee, our shield and our defender. We go not forth alone against the foe, strong in thy strength and in thy keeping tender. We rest on thee and in thy name we go. They were men of great faith. And so they were encouraged by this first sighting of the Akas and hoped that they would return. At night, they built a tree house. They spent the night there. They made radio calls to their wives, telling them what had happened. And then they just waited. And waited. Eventually, Nate Saint got up in the airplane and started flying towards the village to see if anybody was coming. And he saw a group of Akas coming back towards the missionaries. So the missionaries got really excited. Unfortunately, what they didn't know was that. Delilah and George had gone off together alone in, in the village. That was not acceptable for women and a young lady and a young man to be off alone. And so, to defend themselves, Delilah said that the missionaries had tried to attack them. And so she and George had to run off to escape. So the whole village thought that missionaries were there to hurt them. And of course they responded to go out and defend their village. So when the missionaries were there and they eventually saw the villagers come out, the Yakas come out, they thought they were there to be friendly. And unfortunately, they were far, that was far from the case. Marge Saint records that the last radio message from Nate said that they had made contact and were hoping to meet the Akas again, that he would call back at about four o'clock. But that call never came. And the women waited and waited. Eventually other missionaries were called and the US military came in to conduct a search. But eventually recovered the bodies of the missionaries. All of them had been speared to death by the Akas because of the lie. It's amazing to think what a lie can do. And you know, in some cases, that would be the end of the story. The families would just think, well, oh well. It's too dangerous. It's no point now. The, the people just aren't going to be saved. But thankfully, that's not what happened. Thankfully, Marge Saint and Elizabeth Elliot were able to stay in the area for two more years till one of the girls from the Aka tribe ran away from her tribe to escape and lived with the missionaries for several years and taught Mrs. Elliot and Marge Saint the language. And then, a few years later, those two women went back to the tribe. And even though it was, seemed dangerous, it might even seem crazy to us, that didn't stop them. Because they had that same goal in mind that their husbands and brothers had had. 
And I wonder if we would be willing to do the same types of crazy things that they did. Not to just forgive, which in and of itself is a huge thing, but also to be willing to go back to that same group. And eventually, that tribe was one to the Lord. And Elizabeth Elliot was even able to see the murder of her husband baptized. Minkaya was the one who murdered Nate Saint. And today he travels around with Steve Saint, the son of Nate Saint. When people can get over their bitterness and hurt and instead think about what their purpose is, what they should be focused on, God can use the worst of situations to bring him glory and ultimately to reach people with the gospel. But it starts with us being willing to forgive, to stay focused on the goal. And ultimately, to follow God no matter where he calls us. Eventually the movie, or the story was made into a movie, a documentary called Beyond the Gates of Splendor, a book called Through Gates of Splendor, another movie called End of the Spear. Time Magazine did a story on it, and it became a world famous story that we're still talking about today. And because of that, there was a huge revolution and revival of missions in America. Thousands of people went into the mission field after hearing about the story. I once heard Steve Saint say that he thinks God was more glorified and the gospel was further preached because his father died than if his father had lived. When things happen to us and we think, how could God let this terrible thing happen? Sometimes we just have to wait and see what God has in mind. It's probably not what we would plan for, but it's what he knows is best. Those men on the beach who were killed seemed like their lives had been wasted. But really, God had used it far greater than they could have ever used it themselves. Jim Elliott said that God always gives his best to those who leave the choice with him. His best isn't always our best, but it is the best. If we'll just remember and trust him. Jim Elliot also said, I ask not a long life, but a full one, like you, Lord Jesus. How much better to die like Jim Elliot, maybe a short life, but one full of service to God, an unwavering commitment, than a long life living in rebellion against what God wants us to do. Because when we let God order our lives and follow him without any reservation, then he can bless it far more than we ever could do ourselves. That's also not the end of the story because not only can our actions impact people right now, lead to more people going onto the mission field and reaching others for Christ, but even if we do 
die young like Jim Elliott and Nate Saint, Pete Fleming, Ed McCulley, and Roger Darian. God will see our efforts and ultimately one day he will reward us. There is the martyr's crown for those who are faithful to the end. If we will only be faithful to the end and be willing to follow God no matter what. Jesus doeth all things well. To God be the glory. Great things he hath done. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he hath done. Good morning. My name is Francis Jane Crosby, and I think perhaps that the pastor and his wife would like for me to tell you the great things that God has done for a blind girl, a blind young woman, and now a blind old woman, Francis Jane Crosby. Before I begin, before I even tell you how I became blind, I want you to know this. Don't pity me because I'm blind, because the first face that I see will be his. And how shall I know him? I shall know him, I shall know him, and redeemed by his side, I shall stand. I shall know him, I shall know him, by the prince of the nails. In this world, contented I will be. To pout and cry because I'm blind? I cannot and I won't. Oh, yes. And shall I, an old woman, pout and whine and cry now? No, no. Why, if there's a happier woman in all the world, I want to meet them. And happy, why? because I have given my life to the Lord. Oh, children, don't wait until you're an old woman or even old as 30 as I was. Making my way down an old Methodist mission, hearing that song, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day but it was when I heard that line dear Lord I give myself away tis all that I can do and that I did I made my way down that old Methodist mission in New York holding on to the pews till I reached the front where they had the old-fashioned kneeling altar. The truth was I wanted one foot in this world and one foot in the next, and he is worthy of it all. Amen. So I knelt down there, and as the old Methodists say, I prayed through, I stopped my excuses, and I found the Lord, and I gave him all. I rose to my feet and shouted out, Hallelujah! 
Hallelujah! The Methodists still did it in those days in the old missions. <laughs> and then I made my way back to my friends who greeted me. They said to me almost immediately, Francis, you must write hymns. I'm not going to write hymns and have them sung to the bar tunes of this day. No, no, Fanny, you write the words. Somebody else can write the tune. But how was I, a blind woman, prepared for such a work? I'll tell you, God goes before. When I was a little girl in New York with my grandmother, in those days, long before the days of my conversion and the days of hymn writing, was God, God's Word, and my grandmother, and the mighty plan of God. I remember my grandmother, she had an old rocking chair. She would sit in that rocking chair and say to me, Fanny, you have a loving Father in heaven, Fanny. He who made the sun and the birds and the stars and the trees and gave the fragrance to the flowers. He loves you, Fanny. He sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for you. Promise me you'll meet me in heaven, Fanny. Oh, yes, ma'am, I will. But no, it wasn't until I gave my life to the Lord that I let the Lord Jesus forgive me and cleanse me of my sins. But such a childhood she gave me to prepare for that day. My grandmother so loved the Lord and so loved me. She could take the flowers in the field and teach me their scent in their field that I could almost identify them. The birds of the trees, I learned them by name. And I could even play hide and seek with the best of them until the day I crashed right into a tree. Why? Because it was hollow and there was no shadow. You see, I can see just a little shadows. That's the way most of us are. We see merely shadows. But when we see him face to face, we'll know. I wanted to learn like other children, I'll tell you. I, would, I don't think if, I couldn't have become a hymn writer without schooling. Oh, I wanted to learn so badly. Oh, I remember one night I was standing there. My window was open, and it was the night sounds and the breeze on my face, and I could see just the, the shadow of the moon. And I said, oh, God, I want to learn like other children. Sweet peace and assurance came into my heart that very night that God was making a way. Shortly after that, mother came to me. Francis, Francis, we've done everything we can. Your sight is not going to be restored, but we, we found a school for you, Francis, the New York Institute for the Blind. The teachers there have training in working with blind children. Do you want to go? Oh, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Well, the villagers have taken up enough money for your train fare and you're to go. Oh, I was so happy, so excited to get to go. But oh, that fearsome train, the noise. Woo-hoo! Woo-hoo! And all the noise of those New York streets. There I was making my way along. I was never a more lonely child, but praise the Lord. He sent an angel in the form of a friend. She comforted me, and I got through. Well, that is, except to say for the dreaded, terrible, no-good arithmetic. They insisted I learn it at that school. What tortures, what trials. I even made up poems against it. The teachers didn't appreciate that a bit. But you see, I was made to write and to sing. God had made a way for me. I tortured the arithmetic that I might stay in school and learn astronomy, rhetoric, harp, music. I endured all of those years until I became a teacher. But I must tell the children there was one black mark upon my record that somehow they overlooked. One night, we children, long before I was an esteemed teacher, found out that the watermelons were to be harvested. Oh, we were incensed, outraged. So Fanny Crosby made her way out into the darkness. Didn't matter to me. I made my way out there, found the biggest, ripest, plumpest watermelon, plucked it right off, boop, staggered with it up to the dorm room, cut it down. Someone found a knife. We cut it, and just as we were about to eat it, we were caught red-handed. The teachers were not at all impressed or amused by what I did, but I must say something to you. I was stealing far more than watermelons. I was stealing the glory of God. 
because I wanted it for myself before I was converted. But praise be to God, He found me, He saved me, and He set me to serving Him. Yes, I have spoken before Congress. What an honor. Yes, I've spoken before presidents. I know many of them. But I may say this, all I ever am or hope to be is because of God's Word. My grandmother taught it to me. It came from her heart, her mind, through her lips, down into my mind and into my heart. And it found deep lodging there. And it is God's Word in my mind. Why, as a girl, I memorized Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the Minor Prophets, uh, Song of Solomon, most of the New Testament, all by heart because of my godly grandmother and other women who invested in my life, little knowing that, yes, all I ever am or hope to be is because of God's Word. But it is what has sustained me. It is what's guided me. I remember even... Well, yes, I married. Yes, a blind girl can fall in love. Van Alstein, he was lonely. I was his angel. We married. We had a little girl. She was fine. She had a little cradle there. We were living in New York at the time. God was moving there in a great revival. But she passed away. And the Lord gave me this hymn. Sing in the arms of Jesus, safe on His gentle breast. So out of life's sorrows, God gives a song not just for us, but for the future and the coming generations. And do you know what it was that God used to get me to that mission that night? Cholera. When I was teaching, a terrible epidemic of cholera swept all through New York City. The buildings to the left and right hand of the New York Institute for the Blind eventually had to be pressed into service as hospitals. I remember the terrible clattering of those coffins on the, on the stones and that horrible cry, Bring out your dead! I had to help. Well, I went to one hospital in particular. My friend went with me. Now, this is before I was converted. See the hand of God to spare me. And I wanted to help. The head nurse was overworked. I have no time for a nurse who wants to have a, a sense of belonging. No, I have no time. Don't you know who she is? No, and I don't. This is Francis. I told them to not tell who I was. I had achieved quite a notoriety then for the fame of Fanny Crosby as a poet. But no, there I was to go among the patients, and I had a cold cloth, water, and medicine. And I would make my way between the beds and give both. And I was helping, and then I myself got the symptoms. I remember shutting myself off in a little room, swallowing a handful of the medicine, God spared my life. He spared my life, but I had a little student there. I was in the children's ward. It was late, and, and I heard a little voice. Aunt Fanny? Aunt Fanny? That was one of my students. Aunt Fanny? Where is she? Where are you, dear? I followed that voice. Aunt Fanny? Oh, dear one, you're here. Aunt Fanny, I know I'm going to be with, going to die soon. And I want to be with Jesus. I don't know how. I know what they told us in chapel. I, I don't know what to do. Now, this is before I'm even a Christian. But my grandmother and chapel services were in my mind. So I said to this dear girl, well, uh, you, you remember in chapel, you tell the Lord that, that you're sorry for your sins, that you repent of your sins, and that you want Him to come into your heart, to forgive you, to cleanse you. Can you do that? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And she did. And I said, and, and you tell Him that you want to take His hand and go with Him to heaven where He's leading you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And so it was. Within a very few short days, that dear little girl was with the Lord Jesus in heaven. 
And at that time, if I had died of cholera, I knew that I wouldn't be. But thankfully, I had bold, bold teachers who urged me to come to that meeting, that mission, that night. One in particular said, Francis, for the first time in years, for the first time ever, I know what it is to be a true Christian, a real Christian. I've really found the Lord. And another one of my uh, fellow teachers, he, I had a dream in which he was dying and urging me to meet him in heaven, just like my grandmother. And so thankfully, God mastered the pride of Francis Crosby. And he gave me a ministry. He set my heart aflame with the songs of Zion. He would just give me the hymns, all because of all the scripture I'd memorized. Sometimes they would come and I would scratch them out the best I can. Other times an amanuensis would serve and I would dictate them almost line for line to God be the glory. He had gone before. Sometimes a friend would come, like all the way my Savior leads me, and she'd say, I think it was, I think it was Phoebe Knapp said, Francis, I, I have a tune. Do you have the words? And she would play on the piano. And I could sing. Oh, oh, that hymn says, All the way my Savior leads me. Other times, one of the great men of our day, you know Mr. Moody and Mr. Sankey. Well, I've been working with Mr. Sankey on quite a number of hymns to be sung at the Moody campaigns. There's now a little volume. I think it's called Moody Sankey Hymns. Well, sometimes the ministers would come to me. Francis, I've got a train to catch in an hour. I need a hymn. What was I to do? I would ask the Lord for hymns, and he would give me hymns. And he would also give me money. I was very rarely paid for all the hymns that I wrote. And sometimes there were great needs. I remember one time asking the Lord. It was either five or ten dollars. And um, shortly after that, someone knocked at the door nervously. Uh, Miss Crosby, I don't. Oh well, here's five dollars. The Lord told me to bring this to you. And then he shuffled away. You see, I was rich in my soul and rich in my spirit. And I hope through the songs of Zion, others were made rich. Yes, I know they were. I remember one night I was working down at the Mission down in New York City. There was a railroad nearby, and we were sort of the church for the railroad. I called them my railroad boys. They would come in in their clothes, you know, all messy and dirty from the, working on the railroads. And we would have services and singing for them. Well, one night, this, it just came upon me that there was a young man in that congregation that had been brought up in a Christian home, but he was not walking with the Lord, and he was not going to heaven, and tonight was the night for him to give his heart to the Lord. Perhaps, if not then, never. So there was an announcement made. Was there such a young man? And sure enough, at the end of the service, a young man came up to me. Miss Crosby. It was me who was talking about Miss Crosby. I had a godly mother. I promised my mother I would meet her in heaven. That's the way I'm living, Miss Crosby. Will you pray for me? Would we pray? Oh, yes, we gathered around this dear man and we prayed and prayed. And wow, when he stood up, I felt almost a blind woman could see the light in his eyes as he said, Now I can meet my mom in heaven, Miss Crosby. I have found my mama's God. You know, almost 40 years later, I was traveling and a man came up to me. Miss Crosby, do you remember me? I meet a lot of people. Do you remember that night at the mission? I testified about my mother. Oh, oh yes, I remember. Miss Crosby, I gave my heart to the Lord that night, was baptized. I'm a deacon in my church now, and I've been serving the Lord for 40 years, no turning back. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And do you know from that night when that dear boy found the Lord came this hymn. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. Weep o'er the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing. Care for the dying. Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save. Another night, a 
up in, the, up in the balcony at the close of the service, a man shouted out, Pass me not! Oh, pass me not! As though the Lord could. And from that night came that hymn, Pass me not, O gentle Savior, Hear my humble cry, While on others Thou art calling, do not pass me by. Will you sing with me? Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others Thou art calling, say a word to the children here. I heard a little eight-year-old boy was singing my hymns in a hospital. He had a moody psyche hymnal on the table beside him and he was singing out, Saved by grace, I'll tell the story, saved by grace. And that is my prayer for every little boy and girl, that they'll be saved by grace. And for every mother and daddy, that they'll be saved by grace. And for every man who perhaps was brought up in a Christian home and knows they're not walking with the Lord. And every old person who wonders what could a grandmother do? What could an old person do for the kingdom? All I am is the Bible and the people who brought it to me. The people who taught me are a part of the songs of Zion that the loving Heavenly Father has given to me. To God be the glory. Great things He hath done. He sent His Son, who yielded His life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed by His infinite mercy. His child, I, forever I am. And as I go, I want you to sing Blessed Assurance. And if you're His, sing with all your heart. And if you're not, give yourself to Him now. Wait not a minute wondering if you are or are not a child of the King. Take His offer now to come unto Him and be saved. Because I want all of you to be with me in heaven, singing blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne of God and the Lamb. And I want you too to know him by the prints of the nails in his hand. Sing with me. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a to God be the glory.